Good evening. Welcome to the Sunderland Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, the 5th of uh, April already. Um, tonight we've got our minutes from March 29th. We've got a South County EMS budget presentation, an election warrant review. And then we've got our um, usual COVID-19 update, um, a placeholder for any budget discussions and any select board and town administrator updates on our public comment section. So um, without further ado, because we're a few minutes late already, uh, let's do uh, the minutes of March 29th. You and I there, kiddo. Yeah, that's it. Just one second. Mm -hmm. My homework, and then here they are. Oh, yeah. Film permit was the primary piece. Yep. Sewer connection we came to a resolution on, and thanks to Mr. Olenek for that. Mm -hmm. The town clerk talked about early voting and what it meant here, and then a park update. Uh, motion on the minutes of uh, 329. All right, I'll second. All those in favor of the minutes from 329? Hi. Hi. All right. Two zip on that one. All right. And then with that, I'll turn it over to you for the uh, South County EMS presentation, Zach. Great. Thank you. Um, just to make sure we're on the same page, literally, um, I believe uh, <laughs> your Sutherland assessment should be the bottom line, $188,056 to make sure we all have the same version of the budget in front of us. That sound right? Mine says four dollars and twenty-four cents, Zach. <laughs> yeah. Mine's a little, mine's a little higher than that, but not much. Hang on. Um, oh, oh, oh! Scrolling down. That was that was postage. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to make sure we're on the right budget. I, I put out a few drafts. Um, they keep getting lower each time. So if you if there are any surprises, they will be pleasant ones. So three point two two total rise. Uh, yes, correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. So um, as I normally like to do, I like to start kind of at the top of the budget and work my way down, kind of set the stage for what we're looking at. And we'll, we'll finish with what um, the total amount is. Um, at the very top of the budget is our personnel costs. So just a quick refresher as an enterprise fund, we also take into consideration our employee benefit costs. Those are out front. They're not hidden off in another budget someplace. So the significant majority of our expenses are gonna be employee related. Um, we are town of Deerfield employees uh, as the fiscal agent. So we abide by their recommendations on their personnel committee for annual raises, cost of living adjustments, things like that. Uh, the advice uh, and the direction I got from Deerfield this year was that we would continue with the customary step increase for employees every year. Uh, but that there would not be a cost of living adjustment uh, for any of those employees. So a normal step, um, but no cost of living. We do have two employees that have been with um, basically South County EMS, Deerfield EMS before that um, for almost 20 years now. They're both maxed out. Um, and so they don't receive an extra step. So they are getting a 1% increase for fiscal year 22. Um, so that just those expenses right there, that step increase for the full-time employees is a 2.7% uh, increase on that line item. And then the employee benefits um, have also gone up as they always do um, typically. And those are the numbers that are provided to us by our town clerk, treasurer, collector, our health insurance, our, um, what else do we have? Workman's comp, our retirement stuff. Um, that's provided to us by the retirement board. So those numbers are up as well. So overall, um, our personnel costs are up uh, 3% from last year, just from those, those things there. Um, any questions on the personnel costs or anything before I move on? So Zach, personnel cost is simply cost of uh, payroll. You're not talking about call volume or time in time, hours worked, anything like that? Uh, yeah, so th this is just, this is putting the bodies in the station. Yeah, so this is a, 
this is our full-time staff plus our per diems that cover the additional staffing to our busy hours and also the backfill for vacation, sick time, special events, things like that. But again, not an increase in call volume. This is just the cost of personnel year on year. Correct. Yeah. And, and I should have prefaced this by saying this is a level service budget. So we aren't adding any additional staff. We aren't adding any additional services. So, um, yes. Thank you. Um, so then down to expenses. Um, I, that's, I, it's up um, $1,500 from last year. Uh, and that's just um, subtle fluctuations in things like um, our billing revenue. Uh, or excuse me, our, our charges for billing go up. That's a percentage of our revenue. So we needed to adjust that based on our, our actual revenues. Um, other expenses going up, our radio system fee, that is the fee that we pay to Franklin Regional Council of Government to maintain our countywide radio system. That goes up every year because the cost to maintain that system goes up every year. The caveat is we are switching to the state 800 megahertz um, system in the very near future. So I actually don't expect, hopefully if everything goes to plan, we won't be spending that money, but that is the assessment that FERCOG has provided to us for uh, budgeting for uh, fiscal year 22, assuming that that transition doesn't happen. Um, I think everything else, uh, just very, very subtle adjustments, if any, you know, in our um, internet or, or telephone bills. And then, we saw a nice decrease um, under our town of Deerfield indirect admin fees. So for those listening who aren't familiar with this, this is actually money. I see Tom Flanagan's laughing over there. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. This is <laughs> we spend more time on that uh, item back than, than <laughs> what you guys do. So yeah, it is um, Sure. So this is the money that South County as a department pays to the town of Deerfield to handle all of the front office town administrative duties. So because we are a town agency, we take advantage of the town accountant in Deerfield, the town administrator, their personnel committee, their clerk, treasurer, collector, or they do our payroll submissions to the company, all of those things. And because we're an enterprise fund and we're trying to capture the true cost of doing business, um, we, we pull that money out, that kind of those costs that would normally be hidden someplace. And so that is in our budget. Um, and then it gets assessed to the three member towns. So actually Deerfield is paying the majority of this line item. Um, it's just a way of trying to make sure everything's That's above right. board. Yep. Uh, the way that that is calculated is it is based on um, like a percentage of the overall budget, South County's budget compared to the overall budget, uh, but it went down from last year because um, we didn't have any, um, and you'll notice it's actually been going down over time. It's because we haven't purchased an ambulance recently. And so when we have large capital expenditures, this is how it's explained to me, that's factored into these types of assessments. So because we didn't spend that money, our, our indirect costs have also gone down as a result, um, gone down to the tune of $5,000. Thank you, Scott, did you have a question? Uh, only if Zach was done. I had a question specific okay. to this overhead piece. Yeah. So has the town of Deerfield ever provided an hourly rate per, per the service provided? Or you're simply underwriting by percentage of their overall operating budget in those areas? There, so. Good question. I, well, yeah, this it, is, this it, is so a, if the accountant costs you a hundred <laughs> bucks an hour and you use them for a hundred hours, that's easy. That's math, right? That's an hourly rate. Right. So, so, so they, if it's simply taking an enterprise fund and looking at it and saying, well, we think they're kind of like 3% of maybe our total cost, maybe, maybe you're giving Deerfield a little too much money. What, what they what they do, Scott, it's, it's uh, and it's an ongoing discussion. And that's why Zach, when he said it's, it's reduced this year. Right. Is we're trying to we're trying to dial in that number. So right. what it's doing is that you're looking at the different positions at the in the town of in the town of Deerfield right. that the South County utilizes, such as the town administrator, much less today than three four years ago. So that that cost has gone down. The the uh, um, treasurer we use because of the health health benefits and 
the accountant, some of the accountant doing payrolls and stuff like that. So we're trying to balance and Zach is working very, because this has been a, a con, an area of discussion. Like how he tried yeah, to use I, <laughs> an area well of discussion put. on the board of oversight, trying to match the, to just not saying, okay, that it's, well, we're using 10% of the town administrator's time. So it's 10%. Right. Well, is that a true number or a false number? So we're trying to get those in, Scott. So that, that's a, actually a very good question. And, and I still, and Zach, correct, you, you may, I, I, you deal with the town much more than I do, a, a Deerfield, but I think we're getting into a much more comfortable um, billing part now. So we're actually getting billed for what we're used versus what, what you just said, what we think we use. So I think we're getting that more refined. I, yeah, and, and I will say that I, I'm not, part of the decisions about like what they pull out, what they decide how to like, I, I'm purposely like, you tell me, you know, we'll present it to the board of oversight type thing. I will say though, with my conversations with the administration in Deerfield and the accountant, nothing is done in bad faith that they are honestly trying, you know, they pull out the lines that they think we benefit from and like the contracted services we don't pay for. We're not, that's not something that we're benefiting from. And the, so they work very hard to do that. And as Tom said, over time, we're getting a better idea for how that goes. And I think we are getting very, very close. I, th I think the, the top level view of that is for $57,000, we would not be able to do what we're getting for $57,000 in house. Okay. Um, so, so this number might still be too high um, but I, I don't get the sense in, in that we are being fleeced or taken advantage of, especially considering that the town of Deerfield is paying 51% of that number anyway. Right. Um, so. Yeah, I have um, nothing, nothing against either the uh, yeah. relationship or the, or the um, fiscal agents. I think that my feeling in asking that question was it gives municipalities a chance to look at what their actual overhead is interagency. When I worked for a multinational, we had interagency costs. And so we knew what each other's costs were and you could apply it accordingly. And that's yeah. why I put it in that format. Yeah, and, and I, I think also it's, recognize it's a living document. You guys are you know half a dozen years into it now and it, it's gonna be a, a continued effort in refining year on year on year. Yeah, and I, and I, I don't think that this line item will ever not be a point of conversation. And if, if we are to assume that there's a new resident tuning in this year that didn't live in Sunderland last year, you know, they're gonna have right. these same conversations. So I, I think it's, I, you know, I'm happy to explain it every time. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm feeling much better about it as time goes on. Uh, the other item just below that is other post-employment benefits. Uh, we call that OPEB, right? In the business, yeah. if anybody yeah. hears anybody talking about OPEB, and this a is familiar. all those, yeah. <laughs> um, the, this is the, that thing where, you know, when, when somebody retires from the town that we still have some liability, we still have responsibility to pay some ongoing um, retirement and, and health benefits and things like that. And this is something that uh, notoriously, none of the communities in Massachusetts are doing a good job about kind of preparing for. Um, and this is the town of Deerfield, uh, I forget the actual percentage. It might be four of like employee benefit costs. I could do the math real fast on that. Um, but the idea is that we should be putting money aside now for those liabilities that will come due later on. And this is just South County EMS, you know, again, accountable for everything, totally above board. You know, we are paying our share on this. We're not going to try to pass that buck. I think everybody agrees that universally that 4%, if I'm getting it right, is too low, but um, that is the standard right now in Deerfield with uh, you know what we should be looking at. And so that's what's been factored into this budget here. Um, and that, so that comes down to, um, so we've just talked about all of the personnel costs, putting butts in the seat, being ready 24 seven, and then the expenses for our medical supplies, keeping the lights on the cost to have an, paramedic ambulance available 24 seven when you call 911 and then additional staff
during our busy hours, as well as our flu clinic standbys, our home visits, our games, all those things, that is $1,432,844. That is the amount of money that it takes to provide that type of service. These are straight calculations, right? So that's what it costs. But thankfully, we have some methods to not charge that full amount to the three towns, right? So we, that's the number to do business. And then we're going to start subtracting some revenue streams away from that to get down to our bottom line. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we, we're a fee for service. So it takes money, right, to put us in the station. You need that money up front. But when we transport someone to the hospital and we provide medical care, we build their insurance. And so we get revenue from that. Um, that is always an estimation. Um, and it's based on what we expect to collect from the insurance companies, our expected call volumes, what type of insurance we expect people to have. And the estimation for our revenue next year remains the same as it was last year, which is $525,000. Um, that, that's the number we expect to make back after we bill our patients and their insurance companies. So that comes off of that $1.4 million. Um, the other thing that we have that we take off of that total cost is our retained earnings. So as an enterprise fund, money that um, doesn't get spent the previous year um, or revenue from billing above and beyond that $525,000 goes back towards South County EMS. It doesn't go into a town general fund. It comes back towards South County EMS. And in that way, so we've captured all of our true costs. If, if we actually collect more money or don't spend the money that we had originally raised, it can go forward to the next year to further reduce the amount that we need to pay into it. Um, and that amount of retained earnings that is going towards this budget for next year is $310,401. Um, so together, that's $835,000. So five, yeah, that's $835,000. That that will not be assessed to the towns that is taken off of that $1.4 million cost. So- um, Just your baseline for next year. Right, so, yep. so to, to run a $1.4 million service, it's going to cost the three towns $597,000. That's how you, you think about that. And then we further divide that up. Um, do you want me to touch on the retained earnings real quick? before I pass over it um, and go is, into depth about how we got to that number at all. Is, is there a cap that's been established that retained earnings so you don't turn into a, you know, yep. year 20, you have $9 million yeah. hanging around? <laughs> uh, so the funny thing about retained earnings is because we're an enterprise fund, we can't really create separate accounts like a ambulance account and things like that. We kind of have to keep track of it all in, in our enterprise fund. So to answer your question about a cap, um, we don't want it to grow. We, there's no reason to make this grow, right? It, it just means that our numbers are off in the budget. So, um, but because that money gets circulated back in, part of what South County does is we, we anticipate ambulance replacements and ambulances are expensive. They're a quarter of a million dollars and they're pushing $300,000 now. Probably by the time we buy our next ambulance, we're gonna be knocking on that door. And so what we do is every year, we take a little bit of that revenue that we get from our billing and we put it aside. And so that accumulates over time. So when it comes time that one of our ambulances is worn out and needs to be replaced, we have that money on hand and that money came from the services that we provided and the revenue that came back. So we don't actually have to assess that to the towns. That money, as we add it every year, means that that retained earnings um, number grows until we spend that money down to buy an ambulance. Um, so over, over every year, you will watch this number grow. Um, and that's why I, wanted, I asked if we wanted to dive into it, because I just wanted to explain this real fast. Um, the other thing that is in that retained earnings is that on our budget, we have a line item called operational reserves, mm -hmm. which is $100,000. Um, and that is just that, you know, 
thankfully, when COVID happened and our call volume dropped off, that actually straddled fiscal years. Um, so we were able to weather that pretty well. But if we had something really catastrophic happen where our call volume dropped off, something happened with the insurance industry, that $100,000 gives us money for um, either unexpected drops in revenue or unexpected expenses. So that $100,000 will always roll over as well. So there will always be a minimum balance of $100,000 in that retained earnings um, rolling over if we never touch into that operational reserve. And then you add to it that growing of the ambulance, um, which could go up to 300,000. So there's $400,000 possibly, right? And then, and then there's usually right around $200,000. Um, leftover of operational reserves as well. And that is, we, um, we underspent on our call staff, call back overtime budget, but we got more revenue than we had anticipated because we had increased call volume. So that's a very complicated way of saying um, that that number changes every time, but it goes back towards the budget and decreases the, the, the assessment. assessment. So even, it, and it, everything being equal, if that number is getting bigger than the assessment, it all, it all evens out. I'm trying to do fingers here. It does mm. this, yeah. right? Um, so you'll notice that over time, our town assessment is actually fairly level and decreasing. We're not, it, it's also a way of kind of, right. kind smoothing of out evens those. Evens it out. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna have wild fluctuations. And it's also a way right. for you to build up your capital essentially for your recruitment replacement. Right, right, yep. exactly. So that's retained earnings. <laughs> so between retained earnings and the medical service fees are our revenue from billing that's, that accounts for $835,000. So that balance, as I said, that's being assessed to the member towns is $597,443. The assessments are divided up between the three towns, right? So Sunderland's share is... Um, Thir just shy of 31 and a half percent of that. So for fiscal year 22, Sunderland's share of a $1.4 million service is $188,056. Um, so that is the cost to Sunderland to get a $1.4 million service, which has people knocking on my door all the time asking, you know, how they can emulate this elsewhere. Um, you'll notice that this is actually an increase from last year um, of uh, like $5,800. Um, your assessment went up a little bit um, and that has to do with like retained earnings and things like that fluctuating a little bit. But even though it's going up that year, over time, your assessments have actually decreased like 23% from fiscal year 15. As we get a better idea of this budget, as we get more efficient with what we're doing, we're able to kind of carve that down over time. Um, and we're becoming, we're, we're getting back down here a little bit. So um, I don't want you to, to freak out about that little bump. That's just kind of that normal doing one of these, right? Um, over time, we're, we're doing very well. So yeah, 188,000, $56. Good job, guys. Thank Any questions? A good bargain. Yeah. So, so David and Scott, one of the concerns that we are continually addressing is the when if you take an ambulance ride, you still get billed, although the town is paying for the 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 ambulance service. We still, as Zach first started his conversation, it's still a fee for service operation, right? And so we we will ambulance service does bill each individual that uses the service right the right now we have heard there's concern because there there is an amount of money that's not being that we're not able to recover and it's a lot of, it there's there's some because there's no insurance yep. but there's some because different insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, pay, will only pay a portion of what they're billed. Right. So Zach's next goal over this year 
is is to work with us to come up with a policy. We kind of have a policy in place right now, but to do to start writing off some of that um, debt that we know we're not going to recover because Medicare is only going to pay so much. Medicaid is only going to pay so much. And we do have, we don't have a lot, but we do have some that can't, that, that we don't have no insurance so we can't pay. So Zach is going to strive to bring that, those numbers down, that number down, but it's, it's not collectible. So, Tom, are you suggesting that formulaically you'd look at a couple of years and come up with an overlay, essentially, not unlike what assessors do? Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much, Scott. I mean, that and, used to be the discretion. That used to be the discretion of the department head, and now it sounds like it needs to be a policy. You, you know, Scott, it, it, and, and we talked about that, how our ambulance director, the board of selectmen in, in the town, in the, the, the select board in the town of Sunderland, did not want to, to, to get involved with that decision because it's kind of a personal decision. Yep. Yep. And, and so we, 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 as a board, we decided, look, we're going to leave it to the, to the, um, to the ambulance director. It, it's not a HIPAA thing, but that the ambulance director has a much better idea about what's happening, especially with individuals. Right. So, so we'd rather it be take, we've always, our, the board and Sunderland's always wanted that done by the ambulance director, not, not by us. We don't, there's a lot of things that we don't want. That's one of them because mm -hmm. that, that, that gets into politics. So Zach is striving, is going to strive to start bringing that number down by writing off some of this debt or just canceling it. Cause there's no way that we re can recover that. Right. And that ties in Tom to Zach's presentation about, you know, the, the reserved funds. Right. If there's a formula in that reserved funds that allocates that says, hey, one percent, two percent, whatever it is, any given year, we want to set aside for, you know, uncollectible, uncollectible uh, fees. And it simply becomes a formula and a program. It's not names. It's not uh, subjective. Exactly. It's very formulaic and you just do it. Yep. Absolutely. And, just and, like our... and, and we and, and, and you know, we, we've been doing a lot of things and. And, and this is one of the things that's kind of taken a back seat because it really, we know we're, we're, all of us realize that we can't recoup, recoup that money. So that's, it's, we're taking care of a lot of more pressing monetary things. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of one of the things that I think in the last two or three meetings that Zach um, has been basically charged by the board of oversight to start looking at so right. that we can reduce that and get, the, and, and it's just something that we shouldn't be carrying, carrying on our books anyways. Yeah. Because it, it confuses because people, well, you got a million dollars that you're not billing. It's like, well, we have billed, we just can't collect. Right. right. It's a better definition of it. And then not unlike what we do with our free cash, we've got a policy that we apply to it rather than. Yeah. And, 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 and when, and we get, when we get better, Zach will be doing it every three months or four months, like you said, a policy. Mm -hmm. And, and that way we'll whittle that down. So that's, it's a more, and it, and then we still, we still have receipts, you know, that, that we have a billing company and the billing company goes after and tries to collect it. And, and, and at some point Zach says, look, that's it. We can't, we're not going to get it. So let's move right. on. Yep. Good. Makes perfect sense. It does. I think so. Oh. All right. Any other questions for Zach? Thanks Zach. Nice work. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. No problem. My pleasure. Exactly. All right. Next up, we have got our election warrant review. Now, if you want to pull that up at all, Jeff, or uh, I actually don't have or... a digital copy of it. Um, okay. I talked. I talked to the town clerk, and she just asked that we uh, let people know that it will be posted once it's been signed to the website and on the bulletin boards, and remind people. Um, early voting was approved, um, and that information is on the website as well, and um, that the actual election is scheduled for uh, Saturday, May 1st. Okay. All right. Yep, and then uh, I know that was in our pile to sign tonight, so that, uh, that'll be signed and then posted up on there, so you can go out and check that out on the website once that's up there. That lists all the uh, positions that are up for election this year and their duration and everything. So, all right. <clears throat> Next up, we have our COVID-19 state of emergency update. And 
I don't. Yeah, that, that'll be me. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say Lori's not out there tonight, so. You no, know, she wasn't able to make it, but she did send me an update. Um, okay. And uh, her calculations, she thinks uh, Thursday when the next state report comes out, there'll likely be eight um, cases listed over the two week period. Um, I think we have five active cases currently. Uh, it might be four. One of them may have come off on Friday, actually. Um, it, but um, two of them are Sunderland Elementary students. Uh, and the Board of Health has been communicating with school administration um, you know, uh, about those cases. And they've done the contact tracing and all of that. Um, yep. So. It, um, and so she, she just asked to remind people to stay vigilant, even as more and more people get vaccinated, wear your mask, wash your exactly. hands, maintain social distancing. Keep it up. And then also just a reminder that there have been high winds and dry conditions, and that leads to high brush fire danger. So be careful. Um, yeah. You know, with anything flammable, uh, wood stove ash, keep it in a metal bucket with the top. Don't, you know, um, very dangerous conditions. And so just be, be extra careful about fires too. It's that windy time of year and a little dry. All right. All right. <clears throat> uh, next up, we've got a uh, placeholder for budget discussions. Any fun new news this week, yeah. Jeff? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it's fun, um, but we did we did get depends on your uh, idea of fun, right? <laughs> estimated local receipts. Um, we've updated the information on the town meeting webpage with the latest uh, budget information. I think the estimated local receipts for this year were. Uh, about 662,000 uh, plus or minus. Um, and that's based on, you know, the rolling three year average, um, which would be fiscal years 18, 19, and 20. Um, right. We don't have full information for 21 yet. Uh, and then some. Uh, factor for each of the different things depending on how variable so you know some we say 20 percent less than what the actual three year is some is closer to 100 percent depending on how closely our our uh or i guess the variability in each of those different accounts so or, jeff in that context are we has the town been under or over estimating um against actual year on year over those three years. I'd like to think we're maybe a little under and you know conservative enough, but not to the point of risking um, overstating. Yep. Yeah, I, um, I can take a closer look. I, I want to say off, we're definitely um, underestimating, not overestimating. Mm -hmm. um, but not and, by not by five yeah. million dollars. We're talking about <laughs> We're only talking about six hundred thousand dollars, regardless. It's not like we're padding it and coming up and feeding free cash. No, no, yes. I, I think that we're, um, you know, between a hundred and and two hundred thousand um, dollars underestimating, and I, I think that that's the the safer way to budget, in my right. opinion. You'd rather you'd rather, rather be a little under your yeah. revenue. And come in above. Um, obviously, you want to be as close as you can, but um, yeah, than we, the alternative. we have not overestimated. So, in in that context, as we talk about local receipts, and this is on the income or the revenue side of the ledger, you know, we have north of four hundred thousand dollars of free cash this year. That's been certified, correct? Uh, just about four hundred thousand just about $400,000, which if you look at our global budget is a little south of where we actually should be moving into the current year. Was that a function of, since we're talking about the budget, was that a function of underestimating local receipts or were there other factors there? 
Uh, there were other factors there. I think the, the primary factor was uh, lower than anticipated uh, real estate tax collections. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was the biggest factor. There are a couple of grant accounts that we need to do some additional discovery on um, that, that we were dinged a little bit. And I think that I, I want to do a, a deeper dive into the expenses and make sure that they were uh, connected to the correct accounts because I think there were some that that may not have been right. and and they're very similarly named accounts too right. so it's um, certainly possible but yeah the, the major thing was uh, um, lower than expected tax collections so I, I say that with having a little bit of that history and that background uh, information prior to this meeting to remind people that our revenue volatility hasn't gone away. And I think that's important okay. to bear in mind. You know, when we went to town meeting a handful of years ago with, you know, a 700 plus thousand dollar free cash balance, the question was, well, how'd you get that? How did you get that, that balance? And that was an accounting issue over a two year period. That's fine. That was easily, that was easily um, defined. In the current environment, on that revenue side when we are essentially really close to what our estimates were, it's even harder in many ways to say, how did you actually get there? Oh. Right? We start talking about on the on the um, schedule A or the, you know, talking about a $39,000 difference. Well, the reality is in our budget of eight plus million dollars, having $400,000 of free cash moving year to year uh, is a little lean. And that's a message that's gotta, it's gotta be continued to be sent to everybody. It's a little lean. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, oh. I, um, Mr. Mr. Chair, if I could, Ms. Yeah, Scott, Scott I, I remember, I, I unfortunately remember our conversations last year right. about numbers Thank and you. about mm -hmm. estimations. <clears throat> And some of the conservative numbers were stretched um, to be not conservative to make meet the budget. Correct. Um, so we we took out a lot of the um, wiggle room, I'll say, um, and and it wasn't recommended, but it it's what had to be done to make the budget get get passed. Let's put it. But don't forget also, um, when we were doing the budget, we were just entering the COVID time also. And we had no idea what was going to happen. Right. Exactly. So we really didn't, we weren't, we really didn't have, we really didn't have a, um, a hearty discussion about the budget last year because we, it was more important to make the budget work than to really go through every single nook and cranny of the budget also so there's a lot of, i think there's a lot of there was a lot of parts last year yeah there's no no doubt about that tom and the reason i raised the point about a 400 just short of four hundred thousand dollar free cash certification is that set against the backdrop of that larger total budget that's a lean number it is. and that's on the revenue side yep. and if you look at our growth and estimated receipts local receipts, if we stay in that 80% of a three-year trend, we could see those numbers start squeezing down and down again. And maybe it's not this year, but right. again, it could be in another year or God forbid some anomaly where the town's got to do something and they don't have the resources to do it. Again, right. I raise that with a little bit of a, a little bit of a working knowledge about the, that revenue side. Absolutely, Scott. We don't want those lines getting too close together. Yeah, and then That's essentially you're setting the town up for setting the town up for uh, a fall. Exactly. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Any other uh, questions on the budget at all for tonight? There'll be plenty more discussions as we go along. So, so Jeff, what pieces are missing on the revenue <clears throat> side before we can send out any guidance letters to departments that say, "Hey, okay." We've looked at both sides of the ledger right now. 
and we need these either expense increases and everybody will clap for joy and there'll be greatness in the land or we need those reductions. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the the one big piece that, that we're still waiting on is uh, new growth. And um, I, I did reach out to the assessors today and I, um, you know, we have a outside consultant that sort of calculates that for us based on the building permits that were issued last year and w when construction happened and everything. So I just, I followed up with, uh, and I should mention, I, I think the consultant was, planning um, to get back to us around mid-April. So I just reached out to uh, our assessor's admin and said, I want to make sure that we got everything that he needs to him or we have everything prepared. Is there anything else I can do? So I'm trying to get us set up to get that information as soon as we can. And yeah, then we'll be able to have that discussion. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yep, thank you. Good discussions as always on the budget, so. <clears throat> All right, with that next, do we have any other questions on that? We come to our select board and town administrator updates. <clears throat> um, I'll give it to you first, Scott, since Tom wasn't here last week. Sure, so Thursday, and thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thursday, there was a police negotiation meeting, um, contract negotiation meeting uh, that was done electronically. Uh, again, those, uh, Dialogues are always uh, constructive and respectful. Uh, I think we always, we have, we have historically worked toward uh, common ground and this negotiation is no different. I think that both sides of the negotiating teams or negotiation teams recognize there's a relatively short window uh, this time around. And uh, we are off of a one year negotiation, one year agreed upon contract after last uh, year's uh, triennial was uh, cut short because of COVID. Thank the union for that, as well as the town uh, for that. Um, we are looking basically now at the money components. Uh, there are no policy pieces that were brought forward by either the union or by the town. And I think that speaks, my feeling is that speaks volumes for work that's been done in prior negotiations. This is not self ingratiating it's ingratiating. It has to do with the fact that it's just, it's focusing on the practical, right? Yep. Those little things that are practical, you take care of, and then you boil it right down to some brass tacks. Uh, and I expect that we'll be closing tonight in executive session to review what the um, union team is bringing forward for uh, their um, uh, money articles. So yep. it was good. It was That's 60 great. minutes. Everybody's like anxious to move forward. Uh, it's very constructive and it's very respectful. And I uh, applaud the fact that it's respectful both ways. The uh, negotiating team from the uh, police side has been very clear. They get our revenues. They understand it. That's good. Yeah, thanks to that. Great. Thank you. Uh, all right. Any, uh, any updates, Tom? No, I, I would say that uh, the COVID, if you're still looking for a COVID shot, that uh, um, I, I would highly recommend that you have two or three computers and just keep, <laughs> and keep it them handy. That, it, it seems, but it's supposed to be going down, what, to 55 next week? Today. Yep. Um, today. Today. It was, yeah. It was 55. I would say that uh, uh, look at the, uh, uh, Greenfield, the town of Greenfield's uh, website because they are running a clinic every, um, all week. Every week, um, they're getting doses that we have all agreed that they would kind of be running the doses. And I would also go to the FERCOG website, website for yeah. uh, information on webs on there. The CVS website continues to be a uh, uh, CVS continues to. Uh, um, find um, been getting vaccinations and they, and I would go on their website between 5.30 a.m. and 5.30 a to 6 a. They post their things every week, so I would go there. Um, and then go on VaxFinder, um, which is a state's, and also register, you know, reg register, pre-register. Yes. Pre-register is a good way, yep. And, and, and I will tell you that uh, this week, 
Wednesday, Thursday, I think there's going to be places up in uh, Berninson are going to at Pringle Candle. Yep. Uh, okay. And hopefully, very shortly, um, South County will be running uh, drive-through uh, clinics. So it's, it's the weather's almost well, it's in good a position enough. where we can run drive-throughs. So yep. we're all set for those as well. Great. So I wouldn't stop. I, I would keep um, the United States was over 3 million shots administered for the last seven days. So per day. So all right. We're getting there. Yep. Slowly but surely. Yeah. <clears throat> slowly. Slowly, David, yes. Yes. But it was yep. a lot of aggravation. And and I also would like to 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 say is is if if you think it's you that's the problem, it's not you. Um and and I talked to a uh, uh an older um uh, couple last week. Um that were told that um, the husband was getting ready for his second shot in the place that he got the first shot call up and said, uh, well, there's no second shot available to you. Right. Uh, you have to go out and find it yourself. Ah. And, and the hardest part of that whole conversation is the wife thought she was failing her husband and it, oh. and it wasn't her. No, definitely not. It's a system. So no. don't blame yourself it's a system. Be positive and, and don't be afraid to reach out, reach out to the town and we will help. We will try. I'm not guaranteeing anything, but we will try. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. All right. And uh, yeah, I see we've got a number of folks out here. So it's probably from one of our topics we've got on our town administrator update, I would imagine. So thanks for uh, patiently waiting, folks, as we go through our other stuff, so. Well, uh, I just want to mention a couple th quick things first. Um, yep. One is that our annual street sweeping is scheduled for April 20th, 20th through the 22nd. Um, and folks who have signed up for our code red alerts should have uh, gotten some information to call, text, and or email this evening about that and additional important information. Yep. Um, the second thing is that uh, the town was awarded a community uh, a housing grant, housing choice. Right. Yeah, uh, capital great job. Grant, yeah, um, that we uh, applied for to extend the sewer line replacement along North Main Street. Uh, wait, yeah, yeah, oh, yep. Drainage. Sorry, not Drain, yep. drainage. Um, to, between Warner Drive and School Street to help support the senior affordable housing development at 120 North Main. Um, and then I, I've started having a conversation with the recreation coordinator about um, a Memorial Day ceremony and what that might look like this year. And our initial discussions were um, it would likely be similar to last year, but um, since we can have more people uh, trying to invite more people, it was sort of a limited number of people who were allowed to participate for social distancing reasons. And I think that uh, given the weather and, and the way things are going, we still wanna do social distancing, but we can probably have a, a slightly larger crowd, but we're talking about probably not having a parade again this year but I, I did want to bring it up because it, it's early and so if there are other thoughts on what we might do um, there, there's opportunity to discuss that oh, yeah, that's good the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, we've gotten a, a number of communications from concerned uh, residents and um, people about the the trees on North Main Street and specifically the the American sycamore, also known as the buttonball tree, um, which is the largest American sycamore in the state. Um, and I, I think there may have been some uh, misinformation that, that was out there. So I just wanted to provide as much information as I can. And, and uh, as the chair mentioned, there's public comment. And so if I miss anything or there are questions, uh, happy to comment. But I think the first thing is that I saw 
um, people claiming that the work was going to begin this morning. That's not true. The work isn't expected to begin on that side of the street in that area for another month. Um, I, uh, you know, there are claims that, that I heard that we were going to cut down the tree for the sidewalk, that the roots were going to get cut, um, you know, throughout this process, which uh, the select board knows how long it's been going better than I, but five or six years at least, you know, yes. protection of the trees has been a, a consistent talking point for the town, something that we've emphasized throughout. Um, we had, uh, we hired an arborist to come out to do a report on all the trees and offer recommendations for tree protection. That report is on the website. Um, the easiest way to find it is just to search North Main Street in the search bar. I think it's the first thing that comes up. Uh, North Main Street reconstruction updates, I think is the page. Um, it, it is a mass dot project. So they have also hired an arborist. Um, their arborist did a walkthrough with our tree warden, with the contractors, with the engineer from mass dot who's in charge of the project, um, identifying all the trees um, and, and what needed to be done to protect them. Um, and then you, we're gonna try and go out again this week um, with the arborist and uh, just clarify and make sure everybody understands what, what the plans are in the protection. Um, there was uh, it, heavy equipment that was delivered and uh, mistakenly placed close to the That's tree. Fine. That has been moved, but um, you know we did communicate with MassDOT and told them look, heavy equipment can co compact the soil and affect the roots of the tree and cause damage. Please make sure that heavy equipment, um, to the greatest extent possible, does not go over uh, you know the the drip line of the trees. Um, and I, I also wanted to talk for a minute that, that there is a plan and and you know. You can go on the website and see when the 100% designs were approved. I want to say it was just about a year ago. And the sidewalk is moving further away from the trunk of the button ball tree. Uh, the plan is and has been to only remove um, the topsoil that's necessary and raise up the, the sidewalk so that they're not having to dig down and affect the roots of the tree. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I certainly appreciate that that people care about the about the trees and what's happening there, and I think that that's great, and and we appreciate hearing about that. Um, but I do think that there was some misinformation about how the town and the project were approaching tree protection, and so I wanted to um, put that information out and uh, hopefully, um, you know, encourage people if they're seeing things that 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 they don't understand what's happening or what, you know, that's always, please contact right. us, 413-665-1441, uh, my email address, townadmin at townofsunderland.us. You can always um, reach out to us. Uh, we do our best to communicate when we can, um, but sometimes the message doesn't always get out. So if there are questions, you know, never hesitate to, to give us a call and ask what's going on. And, um, you know, I, I'm certainly not a, a horticulture expert or an arborist. So, um, you know, if, and I know that there are those people in the community. So if you see things, you know, don't, don't hesitate to, to let me know that, that there's something um, going on and I can certainly follow up. Okay. Um, all right, thanks. Uh, do you have any, any other regular town administrator updates at all? No, you want to okay, all right. Because yeah. I was just gonna, I'll open it up to public comment if we have questions or anything. But it, uh, yes, I think you're on mute still. Yep, I know. There you go. Um, uh, okay, yeah, I'm I'm an arborist. I've been an arborist since the mid '70s, a professional arborist, and um, I looked at the report that the arborist did for the town, and I was very impressed by it. It was a, an excellent report, and it was basically the same kind of recommendations I would make, and so forth. Um, uh, of course, the devil's always in the details. And the only reason people showed up there 
that, that I'm aware of was because that heavy piece of equipment was parked on the roots there, which it shouldn't have been, as you, right. as you already pointed out. Yeah. And I just think we have to be careful about that kind of thing. And that, you know, you can understand why people might take that as an indication. Oh, my God, they parked it right on the tree. They're going to dig there. Yep, they, yep. they had messed, you know, dug a little bit. They didn't, not, I, I think it wasn't actually digging, but setting down the thing sort of dug into they the ground a little bit, not enough to be significant, but it was obviously, um, had that not been there, I don't think there would have been this urgency felt. And I would be happy to look, I would love to look at uh, some of the details and I, I, will, I will contact um, the arborist who, uh, prepared the report and, um, uh, you know, because this, this, you know, is an important tree for people in the whole region in this part of the country. There are only three trees that are comparable in the Northeast. Right. And there's, there's this one, there's, there's one in Pine Plains, New York, and there's another one in Simsbury, Connecticut. And they're right. all about the same volume, I would say. But this one is a particular, the one you have is a particularly impressive tree because it's in good health. It doesn't have lots of big branches broke off, broken off like the Simsbury one does. Right. And it's, it's just a, a superb tree and it could be 400 years old or so because it was a significant large tree, you know, back at a long time ago. We don't know how old it was when they first noticed it. But um, it is it is definitely to me it's the main icon of of Sunderland. I mean, it's, it's on our shield. So yeah. Yep. Oh, there you go. Yep. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so Bart, so I don't Bart, think there's going to be any problem. Bart, thank you, thank you for uh, your comments, and and just so just so you know, we as a town are we're fine with people expressing their concerns. Um, I didn't know as many people understood about root compaction and stuff. I, I work at the university and I involved with digging holes and the, and the university of mass is not a college campus. It's a college arboretum. Um, so, and there's a little difference. So we're very careful about our trees. And the one thing that's always been a concern of mine is everybody pulling off the highway and parking next to the tree, which does as much if it does a lot of damage of that compaction. So I, I was I was glad to see that people actually were recognized that you can't drive up next to a tree and and just park because you're doing you're doing more damage to the tree by by doing that. So I yep. I um I, I Jeff 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 had just so everybody knows Jeff had a nice conversation with the contractor and and Mass DOT today, and the all the emails that we got, I just thought was 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 good because we're we know we know there's 126 trees along North Main Street on both sides of the road, um, and there and that's and it that probably the, it's the most important tree. But really, the most important tree to individuals is the trees in front of their house, and and we don't want right. we don't want any of the trees to to suffer damage, and we have provisions about uh, air spading, um, how the how roots are to be cut, um, and all of us were very concerned when we saw an excavator that size yeah. parked in our tree belt. That that yeah. was is like oh my gosh what what's going on so all right, we, we thank you because it is important to us. okay so I don't think there's any problem uh, I think we just I just want to talk and find okay, out sure, more information over time that's it yep. for me no that's right yeah and we okay. just wanted to make sure that all the information was out there too because you know mm -hmm. it's it's important and it's yeah. it's been a primary concern of ours since we've been working on this project the trees and everything especially the sycamore so I'll just start on my left I'll go with Gia and then Mark. Hi, uh, uh, my name is Gia Neswald. I'm a Greenfield resident, and thank you for allowing me to address you in Sunderland. Um, and uh, thank you, Jeff and Tom, for and everybody. I see everyone nodding. I can tell that you 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 you're very concerned about the health of the trees too. So glad that we all care. Um, 
Well, I'm one of the people who brought that little crowd over this morning, and um, yeah, not Thank to you, call trouble, but to find out find out what was going on. Yep. And um, yeah, it's good to see so many people care. Um, sometimes there can be too many cooks with all the different opinions. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, is there has there been consideration of, or, or if there, if it's even possible? I'm not a contractor. I am a gardener, not a not a tree specialist. But um, um, it, it has it been considered to just lay a sidewalk above what the existing ground without digging into the topsoil is that a possibility? And then that's what we're um, doing. That's actually Gia. That's what's what's happening. Oh, okay. There was there was a word out from Natalie Blaze's office that that the topsoil would be dug. So. And, and, and Bart, are you still on? Yeah. So, so just from my knowledge of, of trees, the, the best thing that the best thing in our, the best thing in our favor is the, the sidewalk has been there for a long, long time, long time. And so what that tree actually does is it recognizes that it can't get nutrients on that side so it actually goes on the other side it gets nutrients from both sides like <laughs> yeah. it, it, it grows it, under it, the it, sidewalk <laughs> it grows under the sidewalk some of the roots are on the other side of the road if you look at the the, the drip line from that tree is immense and the okay. roots are not always identical to the drip line they used to say that in the arborist texts originally but they don't say that anymore yeah. um it, it was it was an assumption um but anyway, it's, 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 yeah, obviously trees going to get a little bit more nutrients from the other side. You're right. <laughs> but uh, and, and it's, it, it's all over the place. And even under the road, it's getting nutrients. <laughs> I, I just think it's kind of, it's, it's interesting how, because unfortunately I've dug around trees to put steam lines in and it's interesting to find out where the roots are, are going. And cause they not don't, aren't necessarily where you think they, or, and a lot yes. of times they're within that first 12 to 18 inches from the surface from so right mm -hmm. we're, we're unfortunate unfortunately we we actually you know it's funny because we actually looked at um moving the sidewalk more towards the road that was the original that was the original um uh, uh, proposal um and it ended up staying where it is and I think we're better off as long as we take the necessary precautions that mm. instead of trying to rip up the roots on the other side so uh -huh. we'll see well well as I say the impact we'll talk more and figure it out I'm gonna yeah. mute myself so I won't take up well thank you I was also wondering yep. if you considered uh blocking off I know all the trees are important, but before the sycamore blocking, uh, somehow cordoning off the grass so that people can maybe walk there but not park there in the future. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about that. Uh -huh. Especially Tom, you were mentioning that earlier about maybe trying to prevent for people from pulling their cars up and stuff on there, so. There's plenty of public well, parking I, within I, I've 400 town, feet. I've lived in town a long time and it, it never ceases to amaze me how many people I see there stop taking pictures. Right. Um, yep. And I, I would say there, there's almost at, at least three or four times a week I see somebody, and I, if I guess I lived on North Main Street, it'd probably be every day, but there's always someone taking pictures of a fam, you know, family or you know, two or three people. I just think it's, it, it is a pretty amazing tree. And, and I agree with Bart. I've seen that one in Simsbury, the, the Simsbury tree. Um, and this was, the one in Simsbury may be bigger, but this is nicer. And also at one time, one of the big limbs did come down and it was in the barn of that house. And that lives there, there was a part of the big limb was in that, uh, that barn, so. And we've been lucky over the years with all our wind incidents and things that we haven't had any more damage, so. Ah, it looks really strong and healthy. Uh, do, yeah. If you have the time, and if you don't, I understand. Can you explain why you chose not to route the uh, the the uh, sidewalk, loop it around there? I just don't. Mr. Bergeron, 
That's a long and winding yeah. public hearing <laughs> process. Yes. Okay, my apologies. Yeah. I'll go into nope, the public it, record. It, it's all no, right. It's okay. two, two, two years, two years worth of meetings. You can okay. look them up on FCAT. They, oh, they you were, must be so tired of it then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you no, for okay. hearing me. That's I'll, all good. Okay. I appreciate your input. D did hey. you have a question? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Scott. No, no. Uh, Mark had his hand up. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I wanted to get to Mark's question. How are you guys doing this evening? Uh, All right. How about nice you? to see you. Hello, oh, Tom. You, How are you? How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. So um, the reason I'm involved, I was a 28-year employee at UMass Amherst, spent a lot of time, most of my career out at UMass, and um, I'm a mass certified arborist also, and I had a couple of friends reach out to me. Ironically enough, right now, I'm teaching a street tree essentials course for the Bay State Roads program at UMass. <laughs> ah, there you go. This, this morning, <laughs> guess what our topic was? Mm, <laughs> let me guess. Trees and construction. <laughs> Button fall so, trees. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the timing was, uh, was impeccable. And, um, and also, uh, Dave Hawkins, who did some work on the project for you guys, is a good friend, yes. close friend of mine, right? Um, so I just wanted to mention a couple of quick things. I know you guys are on top of it. I understand. Um, one of the things, I, I was the DPW director in Andover, the deputy director of public works. And you know, one of the things that's most important is being ever vigilant. Um, right, no. We know a lot about these issues, but the contractors don't. They don't do it intentionally. They have no idea what's yeah. going on. You know, they, they're go, they go back to the old school. I think uh, Bart was talking about this, you know, Oh, they got a tap root and the trees, the roots maybe go to the drip line and that's it, right? Well, we all know now based on science that the drip, you know, the roots go two, three times past the drip line from for many trees, depending upon what the site looks like. So I, I think, you know, contractor education is going to be really important on this project. It wasn't only the excavator at the button ball, it was the excavator parked inside the tree protection fence at the other tree. So some of the contractors think, oh, this is our site, right? So they go right. they knock down the snow fence and they park inside. So um, I've always been a big advocate of, you know, really educating the contractors and also using rigid portable chain link fence sections, you know, snow fence for me, I know it's more expensive, but snow fence for me is just like a, no, a non-starter. Tom knows this from construction at UMass. I mean, I ran the grounds <laughs> department. I got firsthand knowledge of all the trees they killed, you know, inadvertently by, you know, running, you know, utilities lines through. And sometimes it's inadvertent and sometimes, you know, it's just a mistake. And sometimes it's a whole lack of preparation and planning. So I just wanted to mention that I understand. I'm also available if you guys ever need any assistance. Uh, I do a lot of volunteer work uh, for trees and that's why I'm here tonight. Um, and uh, just want to reach out and say hi too. It's always That's good great. to come back to my roots, it, you know, in Western Mass where I grew up and worked and uh, spent a lot of my time. So that's oh, mostly what I wanted to say. You guys know all the rest, but contractor education and being ever vigilant are the two big keys here. So yep, nice I to would see agree you guys. With that. Thanks. Hey, Appreciate hey, Mark, the I effort a, too. I got a question for you and Bart. Yep. When 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 I read about sycamore trees, about and in, in, in the old in the old days, medieval time, they used a lot of sycamores are hollow, is the way I understand it. And they used to and people people used to live inside the sycamore trees. Is that true, or is that a wives' tale? What do you want to say, Bart? Uh, I'll just say that uh, the the truth is that if you when you get a tree that big, it's almost always somewhat hollow in the center. It doesn't matter whether it's a giant oak tree or a sycamore or whatever. That doesn't mean the tree is unsafe. Okay. Absolutely. Um, it doesn't mean it's safe either. <laughs> yeah. The devil's always in the details, right. but that's a healthy, um, amazingly healthy tree for its age, I would say. And um, But there's probably some hollow space in there somewhere. And there was a giant, I will just mention this because it's appropriate, in Bedford, New York, uh, where I lived and started doing uh, arboriculture at the beginning. Of course, then we were tree surgeons. We weren't arborists. This was back in the 70s. So, right. but <laughs> there you go. Manila ropes, right? You, <laughs> okay. Any rate, the point is um, that there was a tree a little bit smaller than your sycamore 
massive thing. The people in the restaurant where the sycamore was were very proud of it. It had a hole in it. People could walk into it and stuff, but it was sound. And uh, then they expanded their parking lot and it was dead within a couple months. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. Cut, they cut off some roots and, and, and completely over. covered everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's... <laughs> As I say, but the devil's in the details and it, it's not a problem if there's a little bit of hollow, but you have to look at the, the specific tree. And uh, and this one, one is all health. pretty good. One of the things that I'm concerned about though, and, and, and again, this is just from my experiences and Mark kind of touched on it. It's not it's not what, hap what you see next year. It's what you see two and three years down the road that that a lot of times this construction real it, it that's when it yep. when it really yep. comes yep. back at you. It's two or three or yep. four years down the road. And Tom, so you that, know that that's from why UMass, we, you know, there's a lot of that happening. Well that's why we have in the that's why we have in the contract that we're that there their people are watching it for the next two years. Right. Um to see Definitely. if they can identify will help identify if there's any problems. So. Yep. And, and to go back to your your question about you know hollows and those trees, there are you know often it's not the characteristic of this that tree, and it's not all, always, but yep. that does happen. And there's really good technology now that a lot of the UMass folks use, where you can use incredible technology uh, to use ultrasound waves and other technology to actually look inside and get a picture of the tree, right, and yep. and see where the decay and where the hollows are. The other thing I just want, and I'll stop after this, I promise, but guess, anybody remember this? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? I still have uh, my can. <laughs> uh, we don't use this anymore, right? We no. don't put it on no more. That's right. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it took 20, 20 years after, after they did the research showing that that actually stopped the healing pro or slowed down the healing process yeah. before Arborists finally <laughs> adopted this. Exactly. So it was right. figured out in the 60s that this was, yep. or no, I guess in the, in the yep. 70s that this, this wasn't necessarily a helpful thing. That's right. Nope, so I'll, I'll make one thing. more comment. If you need any yep. help, my uh, my email address is rmarkfournier, all one word, at gmail. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mark. And Tom knows thank I'm Mark, Mark with a C, and it's really nice yep. to see you, and good luck with the project. And I know Christina wants to talk, too. So hey, Thank you, Mark. I think Wonderful we just had a – dude. thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Did, did you have a question, Scott? Yeah, I was going to ask the arborist before they cut out. Should we have any other concerns you, about too. North – should we have any other concerns about North Maine uh, with its current population of 15 Norway maples in that stretch? Yeah, that's a good question. You should be monitoring them on a regular basis for their health. And when you replant, you should think about not planting a monoculture in the future and planting the appropriate yeah. tree for those spaces, right? So yeah, that's the, uh, we've that's been trying the to get away from that got going on there. Uh, Come, street, come see our Street Tree Essentials course and you can get some good education around uh, there you go. where we should go Great. in the future Thanks. for sure. I, I, I like that plug. Yes. Well, we're lucky enough to have a couple of um, American elms in town too. They're yep. original. So yeah. Yep. Christina, did you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Christina Bizanson. I'm a Hatfield resident, um, also an arborist, a UMass professor. Um, I've been a municipal arborist and in the business for about uh, 25 years, I have seen my share of um, trees failed after construction projects. Unfortunately, I was a code enforcement officer and I had to inspect a lot of construction sites. So I, I do have um, a lot of background and experience in um, trees and construction. And I just wanted to mirror some of um, Mark's comments about the fencing. And I know, um, Mr. Kravitz, thank you very much for emailing me back on a holiday weekend, but often it was the case that um, contractors equipment was dropped off on weekends or late at night. And it only takes a few minutes, just like five minutes for heavy equipment to detrimentally uh, damage trees beyond repair. And, it, and it's usually accidental because there's no signage. There's no, you know, again, what you have there is snow fencing. It's, it's for snow. It's um, generally uh, real, you know, construction sites that are, you know, very um, forceful about um, saying keep out. It's, it's a much more rigid fence, but it also includes the signs. And 
you know, I don't think it would be too much expense to, to put some signs up on the fencing, um, you know, that just says, you know, tree protection zone, keep out, um, maybe even have it in um, another language if some of the contractors are maybe Hispanic and or Brazilian and, you know, they don't read English. Um, but, the, but that just would prevent any, any of that happening again, um, because the contractors are gonna have subcontractors and they're gonna have people that didn't attend to that meeting and weren't here. They're gonna have people that um, quit the job. I mean, this is gonna be going on for months and months. It's a high turnover rate of um, people coming and going. So um, it, you know, it just, again, it's not their fault. It's just, they didn't, they didn't know. So just having clear signage, um, available and, and and again what what and thank you for sending me um, Dave Hawkins report it was very thorough and accurate it just what I saw and when I saw the state's um, plan it didn't match any of Dave's recommendations so again maybe um, there was a, a plan revision of where the sidewalk was going to go but there wasn't for me uh, enough clear information in the state's plan about how how they were physically going to remove that sidewalk. And again, eight, removing eight inches of topsoil is very scary um, for a tree. That's an elderly tree. So, you know, it's, it's not, a, you know, one of the younger trees that maybe can uh, tolerate a little more um, construction and, and topsoil. And, and those roots in that top eight inches, they're the very fine absorbing roots that are really, really responsible for um, getting that all that nutrients up to that canopy of the tree. And um, so again, you know, using air tools, using, you know, other, um, instead of breaking apart the sidewalk with equipment, sometimes it's, you know, with, with hand tools um, and, and being very careful. If you remember ever your grandmother yelling at you to, you know, don't walk in the garden, you know, after she just tilled in the soft soil. That's, that's kind of, um, you know, what we, we want to see. But again, I think you have so many experts here and you get 10 arborists in a room and it, it you know, there's going to be a lot of opinions and concern. But what's really wonderful about uh, Massachusetts is you do have professional arborists and so many people that do know um, how to preserve trees. So uh, thank you for, um, letting me attend and I look forward to uh, seeing the project. And I'm also an avid, you know, cyclist and um, pedestrian of going through Sunderland. So I appreciate new sidewalks and safe roadways. So I, I understand why you're doing this. Um, it would just be really great to see, you know, more communication um, with, with Arboris on, you know, what's the, you know, what's the best method. Of, of really um, saving that that tree in particular. Thank you. And, and Christina Thanks. and I would be, I'm sure, happy to give you um, some examples of some signage that's been used in the past that's been effective with contractors. So if you reached out to us, we could we could help. Okay. With that. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, actually, yeah, the city of Northampton has, if you look online, they have a really fantastic tree preservation guideline. Yeah. Um, okay. And, we'll take a you know, look at that. It's, it's a free PDF you can get. I could even um, send that over, but they've got really good illustrations of, you know, proper tree fencing and signage and, um, you know, that just, that it, it explains stuff. And then that might also um, stop some calls and emails into your office when people say that, oh, yep. it is tree protection. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Christina, yeah. I, I, I actually, and Mark, I, I agree. And again, for us, my way, the, I've been taught over the year, is that we would use nothing but um, metal fencing around trees to protect the, the site. And it was, it was interesting because in the report, it was specifically called for using plastic, but plastic fencing. But one of the things that I didn't understand is that it's protected on three sides, but not on four sides. And, and if you go down, if you drive up a main street, you'll see that it's protected, so they allow, and, and I, I don't understand that. And no. Jeff and I, we talk outside of the meeting, believe it or not. Uh, this this uh, thing is a full-time job. 
but I, I could never understand. I, I don't understand why it wouldn't be totally fenced off. All, well, all four sides. Yeah, I think I think that what the state uses are very old guidelines. So, you know, arborists. No, it. I mean, they, I mean, look at a lot of our ordinances in Massachusetts. They are they're ancient. But no, this yeah. the state uses very um, old. Uh, tree protection guidelines, and they're you know uh, certified arborists, you know are are following the ANSI A three hundred standards, you know these are reviewed by peers and they're they're changed every couple of years. Um, but some of the that old language, and again, it it depends on on um, you know certain towns also have um, you know very heavy ordinances. You look at the the. Uh, town of Cambridge, Mass, in in Massachusetts. That's probably one of the strictest towns for um, tree protection um, around. But yeah, and and so if you're really going by industry standards, you, what is what is on you know site on North Main Street isn't to industry standards, but it's probably old Massachusetts highway standards. So you know again, the state's doing what the state's going to do. We're asking the state to go above and beyond and be doing the right thing. And so um, that's that's where it gets, and no, no two trees are alike. So this is an unusual case. It needs unusual circumstances. Right, and, so. and that tree protection zone, you know, I haven't been on site, but um, Christina sent me some pictures. That tree protection zone around that button ball right now is completely inappropriate. I mean, it doesn't even go out into the tree bell. It, it's, it, that's I mean, exactly it's, right. it, I agree I'm sorry. <laughs> like I not know. even close right now so that's you know something that um we'll see if we can address be looked that. at by the experts out there i think so oh so, so can we I, address I'll, that i will tell you that we'll tomorrow talk with, yeah. we'll talk with uh <laughs> jeff right. jeff will be contacting the uh the state tomorrow um our contact and and i think it's very easy to box that whole thing in especially around especially around that tree that I, although I'm, I'm glad we see all the arborists here, Scott and Dave, because we have an elm tree That's that right. we'd love you guys to come take a look at for pruning. Is that, is that the one? Is there still one in front of the blue heron? Yeah. Uh, uh, no. Is that one that gone? One's not, yep. Uh, too bad. We, we well, have an two. absolutely beautiful elm tree on the, on the southwest corner of our building that between us and the library. And I... It is an absolutely gorgeous tree, but it needs some work right now, yeah, you know, because true uh, because of where it is. Man, it's got a beautiful canopy. It, it's gorgeous, but we've had a recommendation to put a uh, a lightning rod in the top of the tree. So, if you guys are here. Any thoughts about that? Is it yeah? Lightning <laughs> protection um, is. Definitely, if you have um, trees that are of historic significance that are also near buildings that are of historic significance, yes, um, it's it's not a bad idea. Just but just be careful. Um, you know, you, you need to inspect lightning systems. So it's not it's not like you're putting it on a barn, and you have to you know you worry about it in 50 years when you put the new roof on. Lightning inspection will require um, frequent inspections by arborists to make sure, you know, because especially as the tree grows, you're going to have to move about the lightning protection. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, if there's, is it, if it's not necessarily the tallest tree, there's certain species that tend to get hit by lightning more than others. Um, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if elms are necessarily one of, one of the top species more like you know white pine and um tulip poplar are, are pretty um you know attracted to lightning so also hmm. depends on the site right christina yeah yeah this, yeah this, too, yeah this so. yeah so you know and again it's it's now if you want sotherbees to insure your tree then you do have to have lightning protection in it but sotherbees <laughs> will insure historic trees and um um, you, you know, golf courses, you know, estates that are, um, you know, um, just picturesque calendar, photo, you know, they're, they're folks that are putting in lightning protection. Um, 
So, I, yep. you know, again, we would we would all want to see the tree and provide our opinions there, but. Um, yep. And last pitch, you know, you got UMass Amherst right down the street with, you know, a, a bounty of certified arborists and also folks like us that are alums, you know, that are certified arborists would be more than happy to come out and help you guys figure out ways to preserve that tree. Doc, so, Dr. Kane, Dr. Kane's done some work with us. Yep. Um, yep. He, he was amazing because he, he uh, we, we have some Liberty Elms out here on our, and he told us what the problem was and the people that grew the, they said, well, it's no way that that, so we had to send it up there for them to, and he was right on, he was spot on with the, uh, yep. his diagnosis, so. Yep. You're lucky to have him as a, as a town resident. Sure. He, I know. Sure. I, I, and, and as a neighbor. He, yep. he, uh, not, not too often that you see your neighbor climbing around in trees, but uh, <laughs> Brian's climbing around in trees. So That's it. There you go. All right. Well, thanks for all that input. We appreciate it. Great. Thank Great you. to see you guys. <laughs> and Jeff? Good. Um, Gia mentioned... Uh, Representative Blaze's social media post. And I just wanted to A, thank her for putting that out there. The town doesn't have a social media account. Yeah. So, uh, and that information came from me and I may have used an incorrect term. So I will, in addition to following up on the tree protection zone, I'm gonna follow up to make sure I understood what um, soil would be removed. I, I think it, it was the, top layer and, and the depth they're talking about. So when we have, I'll, I'll get more information about Clarify. that if I misspoke or provided the wrong information um, that came from me. So I just, I wanted to clarify that. Um, Thanks, Jeff, appreciate it. Thank you. Jeff. All right. Thank you, I, I'm leaving. I gotta deal with something. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you appreciate so much it. for including us. All right, do we have any other, uh, any other public comments? All right, um, with that, that is ending our regular session. We have two items that we're going to be discussing for um, an executive session afterwards and we'll adjourn from here only to come back in and, and uh, come back in and adjourn the meeting in open session, just strictly to adjourn. We've got, um, an item pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21, Paragraph 2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. And then one other topic to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have detrimental impact, excuse me, effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares. So we'll be stepping out of here and then we'll just be returning to adjourn for open session. So um, we have a motion for going into executive session. So moved. Second. Second, all right. Uh, then I'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Bergeron. Aye. Mr. Feidenkiewicz. Aye. And aye as well. All right, and thank you. And uh, thanks for coming on tonight. And again, we'll be back only to uh, open. We won't be televised. We'll be back just to adjourn for the evening.